My name is Matthew Argo. I'm a research scientist at the University of New Hampshire, and I've been applying machine learning uh, to space physics applications. And in particular, I want to send a special thanks for, to the GEM student representatives and the GEM student committee for inviting me here to speak today. And um, maybe that means it's time for a GEM uh, focus group on machine learning and space physics. So if there's anyone here that has interest in starting one, or if you're applying machine learning to your own research, um, we saw two student posters with machine learning applications in them. Um, or if you're just generally interested, please email me. My, my email's on the top corner here. The outline for my slide, is, or my talk, is that I'm going to be essentially talking about machine learning the whole time. Uh, what is it? What are some key milestones? Why does it matter to us and, and space physics? Uh, the tools that are available for us to use and how to pick which tools are best for your application. Um, so um, I'll go over five key examples of some of the most powerful or most prominent uh, machine learning tools and how they've been applied in space physics. And then I'll go through a detailed example of how, how I've been using them with MMS data. So what is machine learning? Machine learning is the science of getting computers to learn and act like humans do and improve their learning over time in an autonomous fashion by feeding them data and information in the form of observations and real world interactions. Essentially, we want to train a computer to do all the boring stuff so that we can get to the interesting stuff. Some early milestones in machine learning uh, the first one is an automaton called the Turk. Automatons were essentially analog robots with pulleys, gears, and levers that uh, mimicked what humans or animals can do. The Turk was an automaton that could play chess, and the inventor debuted it at a gala for the Queen of Austria in Vienna in 1770. And he went around with a candle candle, showed everyone all the nooks and crannies, showed the, the gears, the levers, the pulleys, everything like that. And then he picked someone from the audience to come play, and inevitably the Turk would win. And it remained a mystery how the Turk won all the time for, for decades. One of the key uh, features of this is that it inspired Charles Babbage, who um, designed the first punch card computer. It wasn't, he didn't build it, designed it, and he's somewhat the godfather of, modern, of computers. The first application of machine learning was done by Arthur Samuel at IBM. He trained a computer to play checkers. Uh, Google created AlphaGo, which beat a uh, human at Go. I read an anecdote that if you put a chessboard on every atom in the universe, Go would have more combinations of moves than the total of all of those chess boards. So training, training a computer to beat a human at Go uh, moves us closer to uh, more Terminator-like video game characters that can process very, very complex situations. I like this picture because you have the, the world champion at Go there sort of playing for his life. And then you have this guy here who's just the interface between the board and the computer. He looks sort of bored and like he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> so, uh, another, another milestone is that uh, Google created an artificial brain. Uh, they fed it a bunch of YouTube videos and, and didn't tell it what to learn. It just learned whatever it could by making connections between the videos. And go figure, after looking at thousands and thousands of videos, they discovered that it liked watching videos of cats. <laughs> uh, so this, this is important because it, it showed a machine actually learning like a human, not just processing data like a human. So what does this matter for us in, in space physics? Uh, this is just a snapshot of all of the data that MMS has taken up until a few years ago, or a few days ago. It currently has 9.4 million files and 152.6 terabytes of data in just four years. And imagine if 
MMS lasts for as long as cluster of MS. This is an uh, incomprehensible amount of data to look through if you're just getting into the field. Um, and these pie charts show how much level two and level three data, the science quality data that everybody uses, and the amount of diverse data that we have. To put that into perspective, the first results paper from MMS led to 10 additional papers, all on just a few milliseconds of data. So machine learning, trying to find that milliseconds worth of data in, in 152 terabytes is a daunting task. Machine learning can make it tractable. Another reason why it matters is that it will allow us to build mi design missions with more complex mission operation schemes. This is just one example of a, a NASA mission that there is on their website. It hasn't been implemented yet, but they're, they're sending essentially swarms of satellites to an asteroid. And the communications latency between the asteroid and Earth is quite large. So to make real-time decisions on sending uh, what colonies of ants, these uh, microsatellites, to which satellites, is a somewhat real-time decision that the communications latency would allow. And just the swarm aspect and the distance really requires autonomous functionality. And machine learning uh, supports that. Uh, so what can we use? What tools are available to us? And uh, how do we pick which one to use? Machine learning uh, is broken into three different branches. Supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and reinforcement learning. In supervised learning, you have a predefined target variable, so you know what your answer is ahead of time. And then you, you have all of the date, data, and you want to create a mapping function that maps the data that you have onto the answer that you want. And then you apply that mapping function to new data to predict, uh, predict events. Uh, supervised learning can be broken down into classification and regression. In classification, the output is a category, like a color. Uh, in regression, the output is a continuous variable, like a probability. For unsupervised learning, there is no target variable. And so you have all your data, and you want to learn something about your data. Uh, unsupervised learning can be broken into clustering and dimensionality reduction. In clustering, you give the machine your data and you want it to group the data together by common features. It forms clusters that make your overall data set larger to interpret. Dimensionality reduction, uh, the machine essentially looks for the dimension of all of your parameters that varies the most. And you pick the, the dimensions of your parameters that have the most variance and you analyze those and can ignore the rest of them. So it may, turns a large data set into a smaller data set. Reinforcement learning machines face game-like situations. So for each decision that the computer makes, it's given a reward or a penalty. And the goal for the machine is to maximize the award that it gets. The programmer dictates the reward policy, but it doesn't dictate what the solution should be. And so the, the machine essentially is playing a game to maximize its reward. So what, what you want to learn dictates how, how you should try to learn. Uh, to pick which of these methods is best to use, there's this handy flow diagram. You can uh, take your, what you have in mind for your data set, walk your way through this uh, diagram to find your starting point. When I first started, I walked, I started here at start, obviously, worked my way down, and eventually got to tough luck. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to rethink what I was doing, uh, reanalyze my data, and, and come back with a new approach. The tools that are available to us start to use are um, mostly Python and are in mostly Python and R. Um, and there are, are packages for data handling to prepare our data, machine learning to learn about our data, and then these to visualize our data. 
And as a shortcut to data handling and data visualization, you can look at these uh, packages in Python, Helio, Pi, Sun, Pi, Astro, Pi, there are several more. They'll make that easier, so all, all you have to do is worry about the machine learning aspect of things. Um, so now I have five examples of how key machine learning tools have been used in space physics. The first is decision trees. Decision trees are a form of supervised learning that are good at both classification and regression. And remember that classification, in classification your, your target is a category. Uh, so what category does your data belong to? For regression, your goal is to identify the probability that your data belongs to a certain category. And it's easy to interpret because it, it follows a simple if-then-else uh, rules. So, um, starting with all of your data, it breaks your data up into chunks and makes decisions uh, uh, based on what it learns. And uh, you can get to your final decision at the bottom trace your way back up through all of the decisions that it made to learn what, what is the, how is your data leading to these predictions. Uh, decision trees were used to predict solar energetic particle events uh, using x-ray information from SOHO and solar en uh, energetic particles from GOES. Uh, the input data was the x-ray data, the, out the output information was, was there a uh, solar energetic particle event or not. And the decision trees mapped that so that you could predict which, which X-ray events would lead to solar energetic particle events. Uh, the second example is uh, support vector machines. S support vector machines are a type of super supervised classification learning algorithm. And they create hyperplanes that separate your data. So for this example, they're trying to uh, create a 3D model of the magnetopause. So you have your points that are magnetopause crossings, your points that aren't magnetopause crossings, and essentially you draw a line through them that best separates the data, and this is your hyperplane uh, for multi-dimensional data. They created a model taking into account uh, labeling their data by dipole tilt, um, solar wind dynamic pressure, and uh, IMF BZ, and created a model, a 3D model that is um, here you can see indentations due to the polar cusps, and here you can see a deformation in the ZY plane, where analytical models that uh, form uh, take assume axis symmetry wouldn't necessarily get either of these. Third example is uh, Bayesian analysis. In Bayesian analysis, you have a prior a likelihood function and a posterior distribution. Your prior distribution is everything that you know about your data going into your problem. Your likelihood function is the likelihood that your hypothesis is true given a new set of data. And your posterior is your, your, how your beliefs have changed after getting this new data. And these Bayesian inference analysis was used in image data to um, so image tried to sound boundaries in the magnetopause. And these enhancements in, in power here, these discrete lines, uh, are indicative of the boundaries. But you can see that they don't really stand out above the noise very much. So given the prior distribution of what they knew about the noise of their instrument and the distributions of the, the signal that they're looking at, they can extract, they can extract signal from high a low signal to noise data. Our third example is a hidden Markov model, which I guess is best described by your example. In a hidden Markov model, what you want to learn is sort of hidden from you, and you need to make an inference from the data. So say you're inside without any inside and there aren't any windows and you want to know what you should wear for, for the day. If you see people coming in with sundresses, you make an inference that it's hot outside. So your observable lets you know what, what your objective is, how, how you should dress. Uh, if someone walks in with a coat, you can, you can infer that it's cold outside. And all of, all of your past experiences build up to the information that you have at the present. That present information that you have allows you to 
predict something about the future. Uh, people from GOES were able to use hidden Markov models to predict and identify um, Kevin Helmholtz sensibilities in GOES data. Uh, so using the, the observables that they have, the data from the satellite, they were able to find the hidden variable, uh, the, whether it was a, a Kevin Helmholtz wave or not. Our, the next example is a neural network. A neural network is a set of neurons that mimic the brain's processing capabilities. So you, you have your input, input data, you feed it to a set of neurons, they apply a gain and offset and interlink the data and pass it further down into more sets of neurons. Finally, they output what the prediction should be. Um, so a neural network was used uh, with Themis data to predict the state of the inner magnetosphere. Given uh, SIMH as an indicator of what phase of a substorm you're in, they used Themis data, the sparse Themis data in neural networks to map out what the, the, the density in the inner magnetosphere would be at each, each phase of the storm. So, Going into the storm, you can see the density profile, and at, at, uh, at, in the center of the storm, it, the density profile changes, and then in the late recovery phase, you can see that too. <coughs> so now I'll get into a detailed uh, examples of machine learning and using MMS data. And I'll, I'll use the, the tools that I just introduced in a more complex manner to create a, a model for predicting. Uh, before I get into it though, I need to outline the problem, and so I'll, I'll discuss selecting burst intervals with MMS data. And the goal of MMS is to study the microphysics of reconnection. Magnetic reconnection drives the flow of energy throughout the magnetosphere. So if you take these solar wind magnetic field lines in gold, imagine that they're flowing forward and towards the magnetoplasm. They, they combine with the mag they break and reconnect, here with the uh, green magnetosphere field lines. Uh, so the, the Earth's field lines open up, allowing the energized plasma from reconnection and the solar wind particles to enter into the magnetosphere. The reconnected field lines in purple convect into the magneto tail. The buildup in magnetic pressure compresses the tail. We get reconnection in the tail, magneto tail. The reconnection restores magnetic flux and the energetic particles into the inner magnetosphere and the cycle repeats itself. And this global flow of magnetic energy is triggered by the microphysics of the electron diffusion region here in the center of the reconnection region. Before MMS, only about three uh, confirmed EDR events had been studied. And so uh, identifying and studying reconnection was important. To do this, MMS designed its orbit to spend the most time where reconnection is occurring, and I'll be considering the magneto pause. So throughout the entire MMS orbit, it's getting low resolution survey data. And then the science region of interest is where we're, we spend most of the time around the magneto pause. Within this ROI, MMS can, uh, and we can trigger burst events to get high resolution data. But we only have 43 minutes of burst data per day, roughly. So, and then, and we only have a little amount of time to select that data and get it to the ground before it's overwritten again. So, selecting the right 43 minutes in this in this orbit is very important to achieving MMS mission goals. One way that it does it is through the scientist in the loop. The scientist in the loop looks at all of the low resolution data and tries to identify magneto pause crossings where these EDR events are likely to occur. And if uh, you're overwhelmed by the density of information in this plot, you have a tiny idea of what it's like to be the SIDL for a day. Uh, the, SIDL, the SIDL loop uh, changes every week, and their goal is to, to make these selections. So the second to last panel here is the onboard automated burst trigger selections. Whereas the bottom panel here is what the human SIDL has selected. You can see that the, the onboard burst uh, automated selections aren't doing very much, and that the SIDL has to 
spend a lot of time making a lot of different selections. We want to reduce the amount of time that the SIDL takes uh, by applying machine learning algorithms. MMS has three methods to uh, select burst intervals. I just talked about the human and I introduced the automated burst triggers. We have the ability to, to change these burst triggers to better identify events and Bill Patterson is working on those. I'll show a couple slides. But mostly I'll be talking about the ground loop. The ground loop uses all of the data available to, to the SIDL and applies machine learning algorithms to it to make the selections. <clears throat> so getting into the burst triggers, our high resolution data is summarized in, in just 10 second segments called trigger data numbers. These trigger data numbers can we can apply an offset and a gain to them to uh, prioritize some parameters and deprioritize other parameters, depending on what we're looking for. So just as an example, uh, here is our, our table of triggers in, in the magneto tail and on the day side. And um, the left column in each, in each table is the parameter, and then the right two columns are the gain and the offset. And um, so we've been, we've been playing with these to best identify the and identify EDRs in different regions of space. And applying them to data in the magneto tail, uh, this is an electron diffusion region event, our first EDR event in the magneto tail. You can see the SIDL selections here, and uh, the, the predicted, uh, predicted selections here, and you can see that our tuned burst triggers were able to select the CDR, so they're getting, they're getting better. Our second example get, now gets into the, the ground loop. Our first application is um, <coughs> neural networks applied to the SIDL data to try and make predictions of the magneto cost. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is we're taking data from the MMS Science Data Center where all of our data is stored, uh, pre-processing it, and then using it as a training, training data to the model. EVA is the tool that the SIDL uses to make selections. Those selections are at the SDC, and we can access them through the MMS Mission Events page. These mission events allow us to separate the data into magneto class crossings and non magneto class crossings. So we're training our data with that using a, a, a neural network, we can create our final model. Uh, so then we apply our model to new data to try and make predictions that the SIDL can use to, to better select, to reduce the amount of time that we're taking. So we go through the same machine, uh, same pre-processing uh, of new data, plug those into the final model, and the final model pr makes predictions on whether the data is a magneto class crossing or not. That data gets sent to the SCC where it's made available to the SIDL to influence their, their selections. Eventually, we would like to have a model that's good enough to hopefully replace the SIDL and, and automate this process. Here's uh, an example of, uh, on top is just one parameter, um, and what's interesting here is the, the green <coughs> vertical bars where the SIDL has made selections of, of the magneto clause. The bottom panel is the same parameter, and the green, the green boxes here are the predictions made by the SIDL, or by the the algorithm, the automated algorithm. You can see that the, the automated algorithm selections are concentrated on regions where the SIDL has also made selections. Um, it doesn't catch all of the selections, but it catches a majority of them. With a larger training set and, and a bit more training, uh, we can make, we can improve this model. Uh, the second example of what we're doing is we're creating a hierarchical Bayesian model of um, to predict magneto class crossings. So if you remember, our, our Bayesian inference analysis consists of prior distribution, likelihood distribution, and a posterior distribution. We're going to be using a mixture model to create our priors, a hidden Markov model to create our likelihood functions, and then we'll see how what we're doing at predicting magneto class crossings. So again, this is our model, um, and, and I'll be introducing a mixture model uh, so taking all your data, remember that our prior dis our, our, in the Bayesian model, we don't deal with individual data points. Instead, we summarize our parameters like the total magnetic field or other things 
as a distribution. And if we just have a single distribution, it's easy to figure out what the mean and standard deviation is and fit it to a, a normal distribution. However, if our data is a mixture of two distri different distributions, without this color coding here, it's, it's a little bit difficult to identify which distribution each data point belongs to. Um, for that, there's expectation maximization. And uh, so in this, given a, get, given a data point, what we want to, to maximize our expectation that is it, it is one within a standard deviation of the mean. Again, you can see two groups of data here, and the algorithm is uh, slowly focusing in on these two distributions. So applying this idea to MMS data, you can see here that MMS makes a transition from the magnetosphere out into the magneto sheath and into the magnetosphere again. As we're building our distribution, not looking at individual data points, but combining this into a full distribution, uh, the magnetosphere data points overlap with the magneto sheath data points, and we have this mixture of two distri distributions that we have to separate to get our priors. So the histogram here, you can see the two distributions. Uh, we can separate them out into the magnetosphere and magnetosheath distributions so that our data is some combination of our magnetosheath and magnetosphere distributions. And these, these constitute our priors. Applying them to our four parameters that we're using, density, temperature, total magnetic field, and clock angle, we get priors for all of them. So then uh, we use a hidden Markov model to create our likelihood function. One key component of machine learning is that it assumes that your data is, is independent and identically distributed, essentially that they're random variables. So to test this with our data, we just take uh, leg one autocorrelation over three months of data and find that it's not quite a random variable. The laws of physics make sure that you can't just randomly go from one place to another. Um, so it's, it's primarily like, somewhat linearly correlated. To so factor in a randomness component, instead we take the difference between adjacent data points and see what the distribution looks like. It turns out that the data at t minus 1 is randomly distributed about the data at time t. And so thinking about this in terms of our Markov model, taking our observations and trying to infer whether we're in, at the magneto cause or not. Uh, we, we take what we know about our data at time t and figure out what the likelihood is that we're, say, say we're in the magneto pause, magnetosphere at time t minus 1. What is the likelihood that we'll be in the magnetosphere again at time t? And if we make a, a jump, the data jumps just a, a standard deviation or less, the likelihood is that we're still in the magnetosphere. If the data jumps by much more than a standard deviation, we've probably made a standard, uh, transition into the magnetosphere. Um, so this uh, creates our hierarchical model where we're ranking our data based on where we believe it to be. So our likelihood function tells us how likely we are, we are to be in the magnetosheath and the magnetosphere. Uh, lambda of 1 means we're in the magnetosheath. Lambda, lambda of 0 means we're in the magnetosphere. A lambda of 0 0.5 means we're at some mixture between the magneto sheath and the magneto sphere, which is probably the magneto pause. So given a new data and our prior distributions, we want to figure out what our likelihood value is to predict whether we're in the magneto pause at the magneto plus value. So once we get our likely, likelihood distributions for all of our data, we can combine these likelihood functions into a single priority value indicating whether we're in the magneto pause. And we do this uh, by multivariate linear regression. The nice thing about it, this linear regression is that it also ranks our data by what, what parameter uh, is most indicative of the magneto pause. Um, so now, now that I've gone through all that, it sounds pretty complicated. How how complicated is it to actually apply to our data? Here's just one, uh, one example of linear regression in STAN. STAN is a, a machine learning framework designed in C but has uh, packages in R and Python that you can use. 
you can see that uh, linear regression is only a few lines long, so pretty easy to implement once you know once you have your data ready for it. The total model that we looked at, this hierarchical Bayesian model, here's the training model, here's the test model. All of, all of that work that I just described is only about 21 lines of data, and, or 21 lines of code. The difference between the training model and the test model are just a couple lines picking the right the, the training data versus the new data. So uh, it's really easy to get into machine learning. It's easy to apply it to your data. Stan, Python, R do all of the work for you. Uh, now, the results of our model, keep in mind that the CIDL knows a bit more about our data than the model does. Uh, first, and in addition, the CIDL changes from week to week, so the internal biases that the CIDL has about what they think is important also change. Uh, furthermore, the, the CIDL knows that we only have a certain amount of data that we can download, so they select uh, portions of magneto plus crossing sometimes or retrain their model to select all of them in the class. Here's one example. Um, our, our four parameters that we use for training, the, the likelihood functions that indicate for each parameter that we use how likely are we to be in the Magneto class, and then the, the scalar priority value that uh, determine our selections. The blue bars on the bottom indicate what the signal has selected, and the, the gold bars on top indicate what our model has selected. And just focusing on, so uh, priority of zero means we're in the magnetosphere, priority of one means we're in the magneto sheet, and then some value in between indicates that we're right, in the magneto pause. Uh, this gold line here that you can see deviates away from our selections, that's the clock angle. You can tell that our model isn't weighting the clock angle very much because there, there is no selection here. The black line here that you can see an initial transition um, where the, prime, the value of the most selection occurs is the total magnetic field. So we, we can see here that the model is weighting the total magnetic field pretty heavily. And then the plasma temperature and density transition more towards the edge of our selection so uh, the plasma parameters aren't giving, being given as much weight as the total magnetic field. And whereas the signal selections are focused more around the region where the density and temperature are transitioning, so paying more attention to the plasma than the field. Um, as we improve our model, we'll incorporate more than just these four parameters and maybe, maybe more weight will be given to the plasma transition in addition to uh, the field transition. I have just a, a few more examples from different ROIs. This is the same view of a new ROI, and again, the model selections are focused around regions where the signal is also making selections, and not not making selections in between where there's you no know, obviously no making uh, One more ROI, and another ROI. <coughs> Still, the selections are are overlapping what the signal is doing. And then four more ROIs with just our, our predictor value. So how does this? How do we summarize this? Um, our our model is selecting magneto plus crossings on, on a point by point basis, not selection by selection. Our our model is selecting the magneto pause when the signal is selecting the magneto pause sixty six percent of the time. It's not selecting the magneto pause when the signal says there's no some, no magneto pause there ninety percent of the time. So overall, it's doing fairly good uh, on a selection by selection basis because the how how they're making selections is different. If we change this instead of point by point to selection by selection, I feel we'd be doing a lot better for our model. So our model summary is that we had um, a mixture model to identify what our prior distributions are, what, what we believe the magneto sheet to look like, what we believe the magnetosphere to look like. Just sort of, sort of similar to what we do in our daily analysis. After looking at many, many plots of data, we can identify just from the time series what the magneto sheet and magnetosphere look like because they have they look different in our data. So that that component was built in. Then uh, we built our likelihood function, how likely are we be, to be at the magneto pause, combine them for each parameter into a, a single predictor. 
that's all I had for, for the presentation. My summary is that maybe machine learning is being used more and more, both in space physics and in industry and everywhere else. And it's getting better and better at outperforming humans at simple tasks. So we can use, uh, take all of our event discovery, automate that so we can and spend more time analyzing and making new discoveries. The impact on machine learning and human physics is also growing. Uh, as I showed before, it's helped out in all regions of space from the sun to the earth and uh, in, into the atmosphere. And, and I didn't look at astrophysics papers, but probably into the outer reaches of the universe too. Machine learning enables uh, more complex mission designs makes large data volumes more tractable, and it simplifies complex mission operations. Uh, machine learning in particular is helping us with MMS uh, select the data that we need to achieve our mission goals. Finally, if anyone is interested in starting a GEM focus group, anyone is applying machine learning to their data, or just generally interested, please contact. Obviously, you don't want to put the cart before the horse, but so when you succeed at figuring out all the magnetopause crossings, what are the necessary steps, in your opinion, to start identifying other interesting features? Because, of course, the SIDL is picking FTEs and other uh, features out of the MMS data. Right. So the, the infrastructure for the ground loops in particular are, are very good with MMS. We can have any number of ground loops and run them uh, consecutively or in parallel to make predictions. What, I, what my goal is in particular is to identify the magnetopause crossings, which you've done, move on to the bow shot, identify the bow shot. Once we do that, we can label every single data point that we have as being in the magneto sheath, bow shot, uh, solar wind, magnetopause, or magnetosphere, essentially separating the day side into all of its component, primary components. And then from there, we can get into individual identi identification in each of the regions. And since MMS is looking at reconnection, what I'd like to do from there is to try and predict uh, magneto, uh, magnetic reconnection events and open it up for anyone else who wants to create a ground loop to, to help us discover more with MMS data. I wanted to comment uh, on the one thing uh, which I also tried to articulate in this meeting. Uh, the artificial intelligence, including machine learning, cannot replace the natural intelligence. Right. right. For example, you, uh, you in your description of the SQL uh, strategy, you assumed from the assumption that the EDR region determines the reconnection. It's a very big question whether the EDR either controls the reconnection rate, which was proved to the opposite in 1998 by Shane Drake. It is even more questionable whether EDR determines the onset of reconnection. It is definitely not true in magnetotail. So please be cautious uh, in using machine learning. Machines are not thinking. Right. So the goal in order to determine how important the EDR is to first find the EDR. And that's what my goal is. Um, great talk, uh, Matt. So for um, some of the new students or uh, people entering into GEM, what would you say some of the most um, interesting new algorithms and uh, new problems would be for machine learning to be uh, applicable? Uh, the, the, I guess the key feature of machine learning is that it can be applied to any study. So since I've started this, all of the proposals that we write, all of the work that we do involves some, some level of event discovery or data analysis. Machine learning can be built into that to, one, learn a little bit more about your data to simplify complex data sets, and two, to make statistical studies, for example, more tractable and 
instead of looking at years and years of line plots to identify events to uh, just set a, train a machine learning algorithm to identify them for you. And this allows us to get to our, our primary analysis, our results, a lot faster. So pretty much anything you can build machine learning into. It's a little bit trickier to decide what tools you want to use, and as I showed, I, I combined three different tools into a single model. But all of those tools are already there for you, and there are communities in the R and Python uh, that will help you out with these. Um, so, great talk. Um, sort of maybe touching on some of Misha's question, um, I wanted to get your opinion about machine learning and discovery. Right? So, uh, let me pose a, a thought experiment. So, let's say MMS instead of being launched in 2016, was launched in 1977, yep. right? And we didn't know about FTEs then, right? So if you sort of look at the data and you're, you're looking for an EDR, um, but you don't know FTEs exist, and you train it to, train the, you know, use machine learning to train it to find EDRs, would it just completely miss FTEs and therefore would we never have discovered them? Or how does, how does that interaction work? It depends on, how general your model is. So um, instead of biasing our model in, in terms of trying to identify EDRs directly, we've been trying to identify the magnetopause. And within that, within that subset of magnetopause, there's a subset of EDRs. And since we didn't know what the EDRs looked like going into MMS, uh, just by selecting the magnetopause, we have all, that, all the EDRs there for discovery. Once we find an EDR, we've found about 35 now, we can then start training uh, machine learning algorithms to identify them in future data. So that's how I would have approached FTEs. Is, uh, the goal was to study the magnetopause and what's happening there. Uh, once, once you find out key features of the magnetopause that are very interesting, you can train a model to identify FTEs later. That's why that's why all of this is um, very malleable. We have three methods of applying machine learning to our data. We can apply it to the burst triggers directly, and our two methods, I guess, or to a ground. Rule. Both of these can be adapted at will. So, congrats to MMS for their mission design and their foresight in allowing all this to be programmed in. Again, a really interesting talk, and also along the lines of what uh, Paul just mentioned, I was thinking of potential applications for image recognition, and you just kind of showed that picture of the cat, right, and how you know, we kind of extract images, and I wondered, especially for, you know, we, we were looking at kind of line plots and using that to feed into an algorithm, but it might be useful, say, for a distribution function or structures which might be somewhat subjective to identify by eye. It might be nice if, again, once you have that sort of set of discovered cool events, whether it's a crescent distribution or multi-beam distribution, whatever it may be, you might be able to also use um, some type of image recognition algorithm as well, perhaps. Yeah, at last AGU I saw people working with ground magnetometer data trying to identify emic waves in, in uh, power spectrum density <coughs> plots, and they seem to be doing a, a good job with what their models. All right, Matt, nice talk. Uh, I just would like to make a comment about this machine learning business. So yesterday I presented a poster of a student by uh, at Calgary University. Uh, uh, his name is Taylor. Taylor Cameron, his advisor is Brett. Brian Jackal. So we published a paper earlier this year at AGR using uh, something called mutual information. Uh, so it's, I think, so the idea is, well, I'm going to summarize very quickly the results. So he took all this data, almost two decades of this data, and he broke down the data by two hour intervals, and he calculated the, the solar wind. No shocks and no um, storms the data, and he broke down the data by two hour intervals for 
each center, he calculated the phase front orientation, and he used mutual information to. So mutual information doesn't give you a correlation between two variables, but it gives you the level uh, the, uh, of, uh, of um, information two variables share between each other. Right? It's not a direct correlation like a Pearson correlation. So what he found is that when the solar wind is frontal and aligned with the Parker spiral, he observed more uh, geomagnetic activity ju just during uh, quiet times. And the idea is that so the result so they think it's related to shear effects of viscosity of solar wind interaction with, with magnetosphere. here. However, my point is when he did a Pearson correlation, a simple analysis with over three hundred thousand data points, he found nothing. Right, so just a bunch of, of points in a flat line. So there, there was information there by you, but using a more sophisticated algorithm, more sophisticated analysis, mathematical analysis, he was able to find things that were hidden in the data. Right? I think the, so. I think it, it's time for the community to be open to new analysis. For example, last year, I I, I gave this talk. I mean, the talk um, related to these results. And I got a question, why did you do a Pearson correlation? But that's exactly the point. We did, and we found nothing, right? So we had to find another tool in order to find things that were hidden in the data. Otherwise, you would have never known. Right. I'm not familiar with mutual information, but it sounds like a clustering algorithm. And it does, it, clustering algorithms are able to pull out, make your large data set more tractable and pull, pull out features that you otherwise wouldn't necessarily have seen. Yeah, exactly. that's exactly the point. That's nice talk, by the way. So I'm excited that there's a lot of interest in this topic. If we have time for only one more question, um, we encourage everyone who still has lingering questions to speak with Dr. Arnold after the break. So I was intrigued by the uh, program that concentrated on cats. And it makes me think, you know, what Paul's question. I mean, so why does the what is it that made the Google program like cats? So this is this is pretty interesting to me. Uh, they 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 wanted to know what the machine would learn, uh, so they just fed it a bunch of videos and and let it make connections. It like the neurons. Uh, make connections between between videos, gives them weights, and tries to identify things. But when when the network was done, when all the processing had ended, and the computer said, "I've learned everything that I could," that they didn't know what the machine learned because they didn't tell it to learn anything. So to test what it learned, and it's a little that that aspect is a little scary too because what you're train say you're training. Uh, a robot to act like a human by learning from YouTube. And you don't really know what's in the YouTube videos. You don't know what the robot has learned. So in order to test what the robot learned, they fed it uh, different images and basically asked it, did you learn this? Did you learn this? Did you learn this? And because everybody loved cats, it learned about cats. They, they fed it a picture of a cat and uh, it said, yes, I know what a cat looks like. They fed it uh, also pictures of a human and they, the machine said, yes, I know what a human looks like. So after, after it, it could identify a cat to 73% accuracy and identify a human to some similar percent of accuracy. Does that answer your question? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> could you pose it again? Uh, well, I don't know how I mean, like, if you if you program it to oh, identify yeah. patterns or something like that's the goal. Like, to, yeah. So the the thing about it has to have some motivation to find answers for particular problems. Yeah. So the the bad thing about neural networks is essentially they're a black box. You don't know what connections the machine is making. You don't know what the weights are that it's applying. You don't know how it's making its analysis. So while the neural networks can make a prediction, you don't learn anything about your data into how it's making a prediction, essentially. 
And uh, so nobody really knows what the computer did to learn, but assuming it's some type of clustering algorithm, picking out common features, and grouping all those common features together, uh, you can extract all the cat faces from the video, all the, all the human faces from other videos. Okay. I think we'll have to leave it there for now. Thank you again, Dr. Arbaugh.